Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in which we are discussing endothelium derived relaxation factor or EDRF. Okay, right, so we now want to see what happens if we inject acetylcholine intravenously. Okay, so basically acetylcholine is going to act on the endothelial cells which line the la lumen of the blood vessel. So let's draw one of these endothelial cells out and see what effect acetylcholine is going to have. Okay, right, so let's say this is an endothelium cell, cell here. Okay, so this is our endothelial cell. It has a nucleus here, and endothelial cells are often compared to uh, fried eggs, basically, i.e. the yolk of the fried egg is like the nucleus of the endothelial cell, and uh, the white bit of the egg is then like the um, like the um, sort of peripheral portions of this cell where the nucleus is not, i.e. it's a good comparison because endothelial cells really, I've drawn this a bit less extreme than it would be, it would really be more like this. The cytoplasm here would be extremely thin, and then suddenly it would bump out where the nucleus is, and then it would go to being really thin here. So this tiny thin bit would make up most of the cell, and it would make up the lining, basically, of the blood vessel. Okay, but for the basis of this, um, of this um, cartoon, we can't really show it what I want to show if the rest of the cell is that thin, so I've bumped it up a bit. Okay, so... What we're going to do is we're going to stimulate the cell with acetylcholine. So along comes acetylcholine. And I'll just take you through the structure of acetylcholine because it's a nice small molecule so we can learn its structure, so we might as well. So acetylcholine then. Acetylcholine is what you get by esterifying acetic acid with choline, basically. So... Um, Acetic acid is uh, the old name for ethanoic acid, and choline has an alcohol group. So let me show its structure here. So here is the acetic acid, or the ethanoic acid group. So you have this uh, two-carbon molecule, which would have a carboxylic acid group here, but it's now formed an ester link, basically, with the hydroxyl group of choline. So here's what would have been the hydroxyl group of choline. And the rest of the structure of choline is you have two carbons, like so, each with hydrogens coming off, okay, like so. And then off the end, you then have a nitrogen atom, which then has three methyl groups coming off it, like so. So this, basically, is the structure of acetylcholine. Now, as you can see, the, uh, the nitrogen here has four bonds, basically, which is more bonds than nitrogen usually forms. So basically, one of these bonds has been formed by nitrogen donating both electrons that make up the covalent bond. That results in nitrogen gaining a positive charge, basically. So acetylcholine is a positively charged molecule. Right, so what sort of acetylcholine receptors do um, endothelial cells have? Well, they have M3 receptors, muscarinic receptors to acetylcholine. So I'll show that here. Here is the M3 acetylcholine receptor. Now, all muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are seven transmembrane receptors, or G protein coupled receptors. So this is an M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. And basically, uh, this receptor will be coupled to the GQ heterotrimeric G protein. So M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so um, what's going to happen is uh, when acetylcholine binds to the extracellular domain of the M3 muscarinic receptor, it's going to activate the catalytic activity of this M3 muscarinic receptor. And basically, M3 is now going to activate uh, this GQ heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so let me draw this GQ heterotrimeric G protein. So I think I'll draw it again down here so that I can draw everything a bit bigger. So let's say here is the phospholipid bilayer of the endothelial cell. Here is our M3 muscarinic receptor, which has these seven transmembrane uh, domains, or membrane-spanning alpha helices. And I will colour it in blue. So this is our 
M3 receptor here. Okay, and basically it's coupled uh, with a GQ heterotrimeric G protein. So let me just talk to you about the structure of heterotrimeric G proteins. So heterotrimeric G proteins are made up of three subunits. Okay, so they have an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. Okay, and um, there are 16 different alpha subunits that you can use. There are five different beta subunits, and there are 12 different gamma subunits. So you can make a lot of heterotrimeric G proteins, basically, um, because the human genome has 16 different genes, which all make slightly different alpha subunits, but which are all still similar enough that they can actually be used as alpha subunits. Okay, so uh, there are 16 different choices for which alpha subunit you use if you're making a heterotrimeric G protein, then 5 for the beta and 12 for the gamma. Now, the way that heterotrimeric G proteins are named is they're named after which alpha subunit you use. So, if this heterotrimeric G protein here is a GQ heterotrimeric G protein, so let me just outline it. Okay, um, and I'll get some colour here. Okay, so if this is a GQ heterotrimeric G protein, what it means is that the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein is an alpha Q subunit. So if this is GQ, then it means this is equal to alpha Q specifically. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, we don't know what the beta and the gamma subunit are. The uh, name of the heterotrimeric G protein doesn't tell us what the beta and the gamma subunit are. It tells us what the alpha subunit is. Now, basically, um, this heterotrimeric G protein will be off when the alpha subunit is bound to GDP. And when you bind GTP to the alpha subunit instead of GDP, that's the state in which the heterotrimeric G protein is on. Okay, now, uh, the inactive M3 receptor and um, the uh, inactive or off heterotrimeric G protein are said to be coupled. Now, in the case of some G protein coupled receptors, this actually means that they are physically linked to one another. In the case of other G protein coupled receptors, um, it means that the heterotrimeric G protein is bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and therefore is readily accessible to the um, 7 transmembrane receptor. So either way, basically, the heterotrimeric G protein is nearby the receptor. So, when acetylcholine comes along and binds to the M3 receptor, what's going to happen is the M3 receptor is going to become catalytically active and it's going to act on the heterotrimeric GQ protein. Specifically, what it's going to do is it's going to chop off this GDP molecule and bind GTP to this alpha-Q subunit instead. So let's say here is a GTP molecule, guanosine triphosphate, and you have now bound that GTP molecule to this alpha Q subunit here, okay, and the beta and the gamma subunit uh, now no longer associate with the alpha Q GTP subunit, and they go off together. So they remain bound together, but once alpha Q has GTP bound, the beta and the gamma don't bind to the alpha Q. Okay, right. So uh, let's uh, uh, colour in the alpha Q subunit with GTP bound to it. So we'll have it in this red colour here. Okay, right. So now what we need to see is what the alpha Q GTP subunit is going to do within the endothelial cell, basically. Okay, and we'll do that in the next video.